Oh, uh, do I need to do that? Yeah. <clears throat> I did not Put your use digest. <clears throat> Hang on, sorry. Right. <laughs> How many times has he done this? The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson, Richard James, and Chris Dale. Hello. Hello. I, th- I said I'm not ready. Well, you're not ready? <laughs> no. Well, but, I mean, I, I'm ready. We've got to do it now. Do we have to go anyway? Look, you've had your Christmas. You've had your New Year. Oh. All the decorations are down. I know. It's that kind of start of the year thing now, isn't it? Properly. Do you, do you find uh, a decorationless podcast studio exciting or depressing? Well, I do. I like it when the decorations come down. Me too. Isn't that nice? I don't yeah. know why. It's like a feeling of being reborn. Yes. Is that... Overstretching a bit, a bit. You no, think? it's a, it, the, the, the yeah. decluttering is a key part of uh, right. uh, mm. a new year and well. resolution. <laughs> yes, decluttering. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway. yes, uh, Jerry Anderson podcast. You, Here we are. You, yes. Oh, yes. You, you Richard Me, James. Richard James. You, Jamie Anderson. Me, Jamie Anderson. Him over there on the randomizer sofa. Chris Dale. Dale. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Hi guys. Uh, the randomizer, of course, being an extraordinary machine. In that it holds every single episode <laughs> from every single Jerry Anderson series. And, uh, yes, it really does. All it takes is the press of a button to bring up a random episode from a random series for Chris to comment on. You've and described that section that beautifully. Thank you very much. If slightly clunkily. Oh, how dare you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sort of, I feel like I've fallen into explaining what's coming up. So should I just carry on? Yeah. <gasps> Fat facts. Yeah. We've actually got a bit of a news digest coming up because it's the first of uh, our four pods that we record here at the Moxie in Slough. Yes. Uh, so that will be covering, I think, things that have just happened and things that might happen. Uh, yeah. Mostly the past yeah. and slightly the future. Excellent. Mm. Uh, we've got, oh, a very special guest. Uh, Ronnie LeDrew will be joining us. Ronnie LeDrew, great name. A fantastic name. A name you may not know, a face you may not know. Mm. But if you're of a certain age, or even... Not. No, I suppose you're always going to be of a certain age, aren't you? Anyway, what I'm trying to say is you will know his work. Yes, you will. And I'm very excited to meet him. And I kind of want to call you Richard Le James now. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Right, I'll just put my name up there and I'll change that. Cause Richard Le James, really nice. yeah. I like it. Nice. Uh, yes, and uh, the randomizer I've mentioned. Uh, but of course, we'll also be hearing from our wonderful Podstrons who've had their Christmas and New Year break. Yes. So they've come back to the new year, raring to go. Fighting fit. They have, and they've been R- sending writing us... Writing fit. Writing fit. Mm, yeah, 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 because they've been emailing us at podcast.jerryanderson.com. They have. Uh, they've also been commenting commenting on our YouTube channel <laughs> and on our Facebook group. So we'll be uh, talking about that as well in due course. So, uh, yeah, there we go. It's, uh, you know, it's back to the old stuff, really, isn't it? All that All the usual and not cabins. much more. Yeah, not much more, no. Good. OK, well. Yeah. Shall we return to usual gubbins with... Uh, uh, the second fab fact of 2024, but it feels like the first. It to does me. really, doesn't it? Yeah, go on then. Okay, fab fact time. Now, time for this week's fab facts. Uh, it's the fabla fact. I'm not. Gonna, oh. I'm not going to do that all the way through. It's, it's, I like it's, it. it uh, okay, I'll carry on doing it. <laughs> fab facts where Richard and James yep. will shout fab <clears throat> yep. d- during the period in which I flick through the book of fab facts right here. Oh yes, uh, that'll stop me on a random page, and hopefully upon that page will be a fab fact. Right. Well, let's hope so. Be well, a bit awkward if not. Uh, it's been awkward many times before, and it will <laughs> be again. Okay. It's one of my specialities. Good. Go on, then. Uh, are you ready? I am ready. Uh, here we go then. <gasps> Fab! How was that? Very good. Oh, I yeah? Mean, well, we'll see. No, no, your fabbing was great. Oh, thanks. Um, oh, Richard. Yes? It's a long one. Oh, oh, well, let's get it out of the way, then. Get comfy. Yeah. Richard James. Mm. Over the decades, many familiar faces and voices from the Anderson shows have turned up in other popular film and television franchises, haven't they? Yes, we know that. Would you like to name a few? Uh, well, that guy from Space Precinct was in an episode of Miss Scarlet and the Duke. Exactly that. <laughs> That's the one I was thinking of. Sort of thing you're thinking about? I was more thinking Doctor Who, other ITC uh, shows, Blake Seven, oh, okay. or perhaps even Star Trek. Star Trek? Which he's been banging on about this morning before we recorded. That's for some true, reason. I, I was, yes. Uh, however, today's fab fact involves none of those. Oh. <laughs> uh, instead, it takes us into the top secret world of one James Bond 007, a film series that features so many familiar faces of the Anderson shows that it would take an article on our website written by our very own Andrew Clements to list them. Yes. And has that happened? I believe so. Good. Uh, so uh, go and read that when you have a moment. Okay. And then you don't need to listen to this for half fact. <laughs> oh, joy. Uh, but which Bond film 
featured the most Anderson actors and or production personnel. Oh, wow. Do you want to take a guess? No, don't, don't, don't do that I, Well, I'll take a guess that it's a Roger Moore film, I would say, because that's kind of 70s and that's when a lot of the people we're talking about were most active. Okay. Am I right? Well, let's... I'll give you some more information and then you can oh, see. Right, yeah. uh, it's a question that's probably kept almost all of you podstrons lying awake at night, <laughs> wondering about it. Uh, but today in this fab fact, we're it's... going to get to the bottom of it for you. Okay, good. Now, we can pretty much eliminate the Daniel Craig era straight away. Sure, yes. As well as the Piers Brosnan era. Yes. Uh, yes, there are still Anderson-related actors in those films, just mm. nowhere near as many as the films of the 60s, 70s mm. and mm -hmm. 80s, where sometimes... It seemed like entire scenes were populated by the likes of Shane Rimmer and Ed Bishop and David Healy and so on. Yes. So, gosh. Now you know we've eliminated the Craig and Brosnan eras. Yes. Would you like to hazard a guess as to which precise Bond film oh. features the most Anderson related people in front of and behind the camera? I will have a guess. Okay. I'm going to go Roger Moore. I'm going to go fairly middle to late Roger Moore. I'm going to go Moonraker. Oh. Well, it is a Roger Moore. Yes. But it's not Moonraker. It's not Moonraker. It is specifically the third Roger Moore Bond film, oh. which is... Oh, is that like The Spy Who Loved Me or the something? The Spy oh. Who Loved Me. Oh, yes. First uh, film I saw in the cinema. Really? Mm. There you go. Well, that's a fair fact in and of itself. Well, should we just stop it there then? Uh, no. Oh. The Spy Who Loved Me is absolutely jam-packed with familiar Anderson faces and voices. Mm -hmm. uh, the most notable of which, of course, is Scott Tracy himself, the legendary Shane Rimmer, mm -hmm. who appears prominently in the second half of the film as Commander Carter, captain of the USS Wayne. Oh, right. <clears throat> named after Wayne Forrester. I no, see. it wasn't. Um, <clears throat> Among his crew is UFO, Space 1999, and Space Precinct, Body and Soul guest star, oh. Bob Sherman. Oh, Bob plus Sherman. Bob Sherman. Yes, he was in Space Precinct. There you go. Plus a lot of actors who played minor roles uh, or were extras in Space 1999, including Quentin Pierre, Harry Fielder, Anthony Forrest, and Nicholas Campbell. Mm. Also seen as naval officers are Protectors guest star George Baker and another Tracy brother... Not to also mention uh, being a Spectrum, Spectrum Captain and Shadow Operative. Right. Jeremy Wilkin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it, it yeah, carries that's on. That's good, does it? <laughs> Amazingly, yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, you all right for time? Yeah, just um, about. UFO star Might Michael... Might cut the randomizer though. Yeah, fair enough. Who needs that anyway? Uh, UFO star Michael Billington is shot dead by Bond in the film's pre-title sequence, while one of the two scientists killed by the villain Stromberg is played by supercar voice artist and protector's guest star Cyril Shapps. Wow. Among those who get killed by Jaws are Protectors guest star Vernon Dobchev right. and Space 1999 <laughs> guest Sadim Sawala. Okay. This goes on. Yes, doesn't it? <laughs> While some of the film's more dangerous stunts are performed by such, uh, by such 1999 stuntmen as Paul Weston, Colin Skeeping and Roy Scammell. Roy Scammell, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But wait, there's more. Mm -hmm. Adding a touch of glamour to the proceedings are Space 1999 guest actresses Caroline Monroe, Valerie Leon, and a Eva Rubasteyer. Uh, hang on a minute. Now, why don't the male actors bring a touch of glamour to proceedings? Uh, they were just a bit less glamorous, that's all. Mm. Uh, while behind the camera, we have future Space Precinct and indeed 007 director John Glenn oh, on yes. editing duties and yep. the legendary Derek Meddings, who for this film designed and built uh, the super tanker, yes. plus various naval submarines, as well as working on the underwater scenes featuring one of Bond's most famous cars, uh, the Lotus Esprit. Amazing. Lovely car. Yeah. Beautiful. So, hmm. There's more. Uh, is there? Roger Moore. I'm exhausted. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Spy Who Loved Me is also the first Bond film to feature series regulars Robert Brown, Protector's guest star, yeah. and Jeffrey Keane, Thunderbird yeah. 6. And of course, we mustn't forget Stingray's Atlanta Shore, Lois Maxwell. Uh, as Money Penny. Appearing as Money of Penny, course. yes. And believe it or not, there's probably even more names we could mention here, but thankfully... You mean I'm, that's I'm not an stop. exhaustive list? No, it's an well. exhausting, but not exhaustive <laughs> list. Uh, other Bond films with a high number of familiar faces and names from the Anderson universe include You Only Live Twice, Octopussy and The Living Daylights. But, Podstrons, we want to know from you what your favourite link between the Anderson universe and 007 is. Oh, so yeah. So please do... Get in touch, mm. podcast at jerryanson.com. That was quite was a list. It? Yes, wasn't it? Who researches these things? I have no idea. Mm. That's amazing. 
I mean, we know about the link between Bond and Anderson. It's, it's a well-trodden we? path, isn't it? Well, I think uh, the Spy Hards podcast, uh, mm. I think, was it the fifth most popular edition last year featured a certain Jamie Anderson? It did, you're right, talking about Moonraker. I mean, there are other connections beyond that. Yes, but, yes. Um, well, yes, I know. Well, we've just been discussing it, them. It's my favourite connection, that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Mm. Would you like to write a Bond film, do you think? Do you know what? Mm. It, no. Oh, why not? I don't know. I there's there's a certain something about Bond mm. which doesn't appeal to my creative sensibilities, but you... does does appeal to my viewing sensibilities. Ah, Do you know okay. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, sure. There must be things that you enjoy watching, but yeah. you wouldn't want to write for. I suppose. I haven't really thought about it. Mm. Anything come to mind? No, I said I haven't really thought about it. No, in fact, most things that I know that you like, you have written for. <laughs> uh, so, Star Trek? That's, that's true. I've never written for Star Would Trek. Would you write for a Star Trek thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, big See? time. Can't stop him. Well, there you go. Yeah, nice. I do like it. Good. That's uh, not a bad fab fact. Uh, no. But I'm just wondering where we're going to go with the old, um, <clears throat> you know. I haven't got a clue. <gasps> Let's see what happens okay. because do email us poster arms with your thoughts. But that brings us neatly and exhaustingly to the end of this week's The Bond, Bond film fact. with the most associations with Jerry Anderson both in front of the camera and behind the camera fact. Fact. Brilliant. Yeah, how was that? Yeah, it's amazing that we managed to synchronise that. <gasps> You're watching and listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast and I say that mm. because we'd like you to leave a review if you're watching and listening now. Just head on over to the platform of choice where you find us and leave us a nice revating uh, to let the world know what you think of the Jerry Anderson podcast. I did see a few people have been uh, posting on the IMDB page for the Jerry have Anderson they? podcast, leaving us some very nice reviews. Oh, thank you. Yes, I That's didn't make so a note nice. of them. Maybe next time. You didn't make no. a note of them. No. Right. You noted it, but didn't make a note. Quite brilliant. Uh, anyway, coming up a little later, we have the amazing Ronnie LeDrew telling in us all interviewed, of... Interviewed by Richard LeJames. <clears throat> Sorry. Telling us all about his fantastic career in puppetry. It's a mm. lovely story. And also his brushes with the Anderson universe. Yes. His basil brushes, I could oh, say. Oh, did you have to do that? Well, yeah, I did. Uh, but in the meantime, a short we uh, see what's been going on in the wonderful worlds of Anderson with a bit of a news digest? Ooh, delicious. No, not a news digestive, a oh. news digest. OK. Yes, it's the Jerry Anderson hashtag newsy news news news. Are we Comes around once now? every four weeks. Yeah, why not? Potterons, are you missing the weekly news? I mean, I'm not. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a bit of a break from tradition. Yeah. We'd previously done it weekly for oh. hundreds of episodes. God, that's right. But it just became untenable. It did become untenable. Um, so, But we'd love to know your thoughts anyway. Is this enough? Do you want one every two weeks? Would you rather have one every six months? <laughs> a, news, a news digest every six months? Yeah. OK, that's a thought, I suppose. What works for you? Email us podcast or at com. Perhaps they want to hear my news. What uh, I've been up well, to. Well, do you want to do you want to give us a little Richard <laughs> LeJames news digest? Yeah, maybe next time. I'll think about that. Okay, I can't <laughs> wait. Um, well, I've got a few things I can tell you about. Go on then. Uh, let me start with a, a beautiful thing. Right. Created by our very own Random Meister General himself, <gasps> Chris Dale. Hi, mm. Chris. Hello, Chris. Hi, guys. Now he he did want to uh, show this off himself, but he was too busy waving. So yes, uh, this is. The Secrets of the Secret Service. Yes, amazing. And it says here, by Chris Dale. Must be then. Yeah. Uh, and it is uh, a bookazine. Right. All about the, the making of, and the episodes of, and the comic strips of, and other things relating to the Secret Service. Nice. And it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe it will be the start of a set of similar publications, mm. uh, giving you the story of these fantastic series. Lovely. But it's a rather lovely, lovely thing, and that is available now from the Excellent. Jerry Anderson store. Yep. So well done, Chris. Yep. Of course, lots of you will have tried and hopefully succeeded in getting your limited edition Stingray diecast from mm. Corgi, mm, mm. Um, which we do have here. But if you haven't already ordered it, I'm afraid the limited edition version is sold out. Has it? Sold out in five hours. That was quick. Yeah. Were you expecting that? Uh, not five hours, no, no. but um, it doesn't surprise me that it went quickly because it's a lovely thing. It's been described as the, the dinky that never was, although it's corgi. Yeah. Um, let's say the corgi that never was. Yeah. It's a lovely model. Fires uh, sting missiles, so that's exciting. <laughs> Great. Or torpedoes, depending yeah. on your, yeah. Uh, yeah, what you prefer. <clears throat> but the vanilla version, the standard version, is still available. 
uh, and, and adds to this kind of growing range of fantastic collectibles we've got going. I know, all of um, which seem to be appearing on this table. Gradually, yes, mm. yeah. So obviously the Eagles, the, uh, the Eagle One and the Rescue Eagle are still available, although in extremely limited quantities. We've got Thunderbird 2 coming up, and although we've got the prototype version here, yeah. the final production, pre-production sample is beautiful. Amazing. The weathering on it. Oh, it's lovely. I like a bit of weather. It's really, it's really smart. Nice. Uh, so yes, there's there's lots of exciting collectibles on their way. Uh, the week of release of this episode, mm -hmm. the week of the fifteenth, mm -hmm. later this week, maybe around the eighteenth or the nineteenth, something like that. I implore you, Podstrons, oh. to stand by for action. Oh, I know we use that phrase all the time. We do because it's cool, right? Yeah. But really, do stand by for action. Um, right. There's there's something exciting coming later this year. Right. <laughs> um, also, I don't know if you've seen it online. Have you seen our lovely Stingray 60th anniversary logo? No. Ooh. What's going on it's here? Very pretty. Well, this year is Stingray's 60th anniversary year, so mm -hmm. therefore we might be doing some special things for Stingray's 60th anniversary right, year. Right, right. Um, mm. And the, the logo will therefore appear on things. And mm -hmm. what might those things be? Well, you'll have to wait and find out. But weirdly, that's not related to the standby for action call. <laughs> OK. Just okay. to confuse things. Yes. Don't get confused. All right. Um, if you've been waiting for your Terrorhawks publications, they are out now. Flaming Thunderbolts, the definitive Terrorhawks story by Fred McNamara, is out. Mm -hmm. uh, as is the comic anthology, which looks beautiful, mm. uh, and Deep Blue Z, the new mm. graphic novel, all produced for Terrorhawks' 40th anniversary. Yes. The 40th anniversary year, really, which yes. runs from last October to this October. Yeah, I've seen lots of people <clears> tweeting <throat> their uh, collections as they arrive yes. at the post this week. They are, they're Very nice, exciting. aren't they? Yeah, lovely. It's nice to give Terrorhawks a bit of love. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I did an interview with Forbes, actually, about um, yes. Terrorhawks, which uh -huh. you may have read. Uh -huh. No, I didn't. You, I, no. I don't bother, really. No. But I said some stuff about Terrorhawks. Yeah. That kind of jazz. Excellent. So that's nice. Mm. Uh, so, really, lots more to come. And although standing by for action, not for Stingray, soon, also yes. stand by for action for Stingray, for Stingray stuff soon. soon right. Too. Not confusing at all. No. Do you might want to rethink that marketing strategy, or are you? Happy yeah, with no, that? I probably should do. Yeah. But uh, anyway. all, um, mm. also, by the way, it's, yes. um, it's Space Precinct's 30th anniversary we this year. I don't like to talk about it. No, you never mention it. No. Uh, but it is Space Precinct's 30th anniversary this year. Yes. So maybe we can expect something special for that. Okay. Could we, maybe we should have a chat off Potentially. there. Potentially, yeah. Um, and as Simpson Scripps would want me to say, it's Lavender Castle's 25th anniversary. Ah! <laughs> Although that show is locked up in, uh, mm. in a bit of a rights hell, so mm. I think we'll be very unlikely to be able to do anything with that at all. Yeah, but shame. we can still we can know, talk about enjoy it. it and talk about it. Yeah, yeah, great. Nice. There you go. There's a little kind of miniature news digest. Well done. I enjoyed it. So that brings us to the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News Digest. That was the news. That was the news digest. 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 That's a good word, isn't it? Digest, I like it. Mm. And now, I've got something to confess, Jamie. Oh, dear. Well, you know, as we prepare these podcasts... Yeah, well, I, prepare, mm, yes. I know I, you do a lot of preparation. Yes, yes, clips and so on for our guests yeah. and the scripts. What we laughingly call the scripts. Yep. Which gives me access to the Anderson Google Drive. It does. What, what have, have you to, deleted? Well, no, I haven't deleted anything, but I've seen something. Have you? Yeah. Oh, dear. Those embarrassing childhood photos. No, no, not those. Oh. I've got those already printed oh. out, standing up on my right. The ones where table. I was only wearing a T-shirt. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, weird. I've seen a release schedule. Have you? Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to say anything. Why are you poking around I my release saw schedule? It. it was just there, and I thought, oh, I'll just have a little look. <gasps> what? You're so naughty. Oh, what? You're wow. so naughty. But I won't say a word. Anyway, no. talking of saying words, though. What we love about our wonderful Podstrons is that they very often email us in some words for us to say. <sighs> They do. What a beautiful segue that was. Like this. This is the voice of the Podsterons. Yes, it's the voice of the Podsterons. Shall I start nice. with this one from Glenn Fitzgerald? Oh, please do. Hello, Jamie, Richard and Chris. I hope this email finds you well. The other day I watched a couple of episodes of Secret Service as it's one show I don't really remember as a child. Oh. Uh, imagine my delight when in an episode uh, called Mayday, Mayday, there is a piece of live action footage of an airport, and on the left, is what looks suspiciously like a police box to me. As a hardcore Hoovian, this made my day. Apologies if this has been reported on uh, during your podcast before, but I had to let you know my delight. Not sure if anyone's mentioned it before. Uh, Glenn? Uh, Chris Dale? It's not in there, I don't think. It's not in the book. 
It's not in the book. It's not. We'll, we'll, have, well, to, we'll, we'll have to re- reissue the book. I yeah. can't believe that Chris Dale didn't put that in. Uh, could perhaps the Doctor have been keeping an eye on Father Stanley Unwin? Well, it keeps me out of trouble police box spotting. Here's to many more great and entertaining podcasts. Oh. And the Jerry Anderson podcast. Ah, oh, brilliant. Yes, yes uh, Thanks for all your hard work and dedication. Best wishes, Glenn Fitzgerald. Cheers, Glenn. Yeah. Well, nice. you've spotted something that the randomizer may have missed. Or you've made it up and we haven't been able to check it. I mean, it. to be fair, his remit is sort of a bit Jerry Anderson-y, isn't it? He's not going to go around spotting Doctor Who links and putting them in a book about Jerry Anderson series. Oh, he does do that as well. Oh, does he? Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Obsessive. Uh, I have one here from Jake F. Gray. You do, yes. What a great name. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, Jake's a good name. Uh, hi, Jamie, Richard, and Chris! Exclamation mark. Recently, I was just remembering a video I saw ages ago about a proposed Jerry Anderson series from the early 2000s. It was called Eternity. Ah, yes. <laughs> and would have been about a new planet being discovered and plundered for its natural resources, but it would later be revealed that the planet is sentient and it starts to retaliate against humanity. Mm. Does Jamie or anyone else know of any information about this series pitch, or was that video some kind of hoax? Uh, on a completely different subject, can <laughs> any other podstrons not resist waving back at Chris as he says, hi guys, oh. at the beginning of every podcast? <laughs> I know I can't. <laughs> Keep up the good work, FAB, SIG, PWR, 1010, SPA, and all of that. Excellent. Gubbins. He doesn't say okay. Gubbins, I said Gubbins. Thanks, Jake. Mm-hmm. Um, no, Eternity was real. Right. Uh, the, the, the video you're referring to, I think, is one of Steve Begg's lovely kind of um, uh, an- animation, motion graphic, VFX pieces that he did. Yeah. Um, and it was very exciting. Um, and then Eternity got tied up rights-wise somewhere else. Right. And um, and died. Uh, right. it, I mean, it still exists somewhere, mm. but I think it's a bit of a rights mess. Mm. Mm. But it was a really great idea. Mm. Um, I, I think the... Um, that the natural resource that was plundered and why it's called eternity was some chemical on the planet that uh, extended human lifespan. I see. Yeah. Excellent idea. But yes, the planet was like sentient. And mm. Yeah, there were mm. some great designs in there. It was, it was a very cool idea. So, you know, maybe it might appear at some yep. point somewhere somehow. Yeah, great. Uh, Mark Simpson Wedge says, uh, Greetings, gentlemen and podstrons. If you're reading this on Christmas Day, happy Christmas. Or oh. if you're reading it on New Year's Day, happy New Year. Uh, uh, <laughs> and if you're not, then yeah. happy, happy other day. Exactly. Well, that's because, you know, we're recording these once a month now, so you have to wait for your emails to be read out a bit longer than Sorry before. for the delay. Yeah. I haven't done an email for a while, says Mark, mainly because 2023 has been a really busy year for me. Some of you already knew this when we were at the National Space Centre for Brit Sci-Fi. But those who don't know, I've been working on the most ambitious YouTube project I've ever done. Ooh. Uh, I've done a series of videos about me and a friendship group called The Defenders, and we have to try and save the world from an evil organisation called The Skull Hackers. Oh, that's an unpleasant image, isn't isn't it? it? The project involves several Jerry Anderson references and styles that hopefully will introduce a new generation of fans and it stars fellow podstrons. This is good, isn't it? Such as Andrew Clements, Chris Thompson, Jenny Davies, Scott Bicleeke and even Chris Dale makes a cameo. Even Chris Dale? He kept that quiet? He can't remember it. Uh, All the episodes are available to watch on his YouTube channel, says Mark Simpson Wedge. By the way, the Space Centre have confirmed that Brit Sci-Fi will return on the 28th and 29th of September next Mm. year. That'll be this year now. Hopefully you'll be able to attend again. Here's to a good 2024. I think we plan to, don't we? Do we? Yeah. I've not had those conversations yet. Okay, well, we've just had it. I'm terribly busy. Anyway, the reason I'm looking at my phone is not because I'm being rude. You are. But also because Steve Bushell sent an email, which I just received this morning. Oh. Hi, guys. Oh, the subject title is Oops, by the way. Oh. (laughs) Following on from podcast 291, just last week. Right. Where you mentioned that I had met Jamie at a convention when he was younger. Right. Uh, This wasn't actually me, but Kevin Lyons, who you met. Right. I was just sharing his anecdote of Jerry stating that puppets didn't take loo breaks. Right. Uh, Although the puppeteers would. Right. Take loo breaks. Right. Uh, Anyway, he says, Richard, you did promise you wouldn't make a mistake that episode. Well, I didn't make the mistake, Steve. What well, did I make it? No, I think I think Steve, it wasn't clear in your email right. that you were telling someone else's anecdote. Yes. So if I think I'm clear. Telling somebody else's anecdote. Yeah. Please. Oh yes. Make that Flag clear. It up. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, all the best from Steve. Uh, brackets who has met both Jamie and Richard in a car park, and he has the mug to prove it. Right. Right. That's nice, isn't it? I mean, who wouldn't want to meet us in a car park? <laughs> uh, I think it's a pretty long list. Yeah. Uh, all for now. Do keep them coming in. Podcast at jerryanderson.com. And uh, we'll read out your emails next time. Can't wait. No, it'd be fun, won't it? Tell you what else I can't wait for. What's that? It's for this uh, much-anticipated 
yeah. long-awaited interview yeah. between Richard LeJames yeah. and Ronnie LeDrew. Go on then, off you pop. All right, bye. Ronnie was born in Toronto, Canada. His numerous television credits began in 1964 with A Touch of Don Juan, narrated by Douglas Fairbanks Jr. However, he's probably best known as Zippy from ITV's Rainbow and later Rainbow Days, but fear not, out of fans. He's also managed to get his hands on or into some puppets from the Jerry Anderson universe too. Let's meet the puppet master himself, Ronnie LeDrew! Thank you. Ronnie, welcome to the Jerry Addison Podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, now, you are one of those people, if you don't mind me saying, mm. who inspires a certain look in, <laughs> in people's eyes when they hear what you do. Uh, Is it yeah. something you've grown used to over the years? I have, yes, yes. I think I know what you're referring to. It's a character called Zippy from <laughs> Rainbow. And yeah, that's it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, you do a character for a job. I mean, I did it for six weeks initially, thinking, yeah. oh, well, this is great, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, over the years, well, it is over 20 years. It, it is. Was, it uh, was a long time. People have grown up with it. It's been part of their childhood. Yes. I mean, it's generations, so, um, he's, yeah. he's He's quite a character. Do you feel he's taken over somewhat, or do you keep him in check? Well, I keep him in check. Um, <laughs> I mean, originally, I didn't do the voice of, of Zippy. It was um, a ri- the very first Zippy voice was a wonderful man called Peter Hawkins. Oh, uh, yes. Who did loads of wonderful things he like did. Darling That's and right. things like that, and Bill and Ben and all those yes. wonderful characters. Anyway, he did the original voice, and then in about the second series, another actor, Roy Skelton, who, again, was quite well known for voicing Daleks and yeah. things like that on Doctor Who. Yeah. He um, took over Zippy because there was a lady puppeteer originally. Ah, oh, And right. so obviously Zippy was a male character, so they needed to have a voice artist. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit unusual because puppeteers normally supply their own voices. It's all part yeah. of the trade. Yeah. But anyway, this was fine. And Roy was with the programme for, oh my goodness, years and years, a bit like me. And so I learned to sort of lip sync yeah. to his voice yeah. and then sadly he passed away a few years ago and very kindly Fremantle said Ronnie would you like to take ah. over doing the voice the reason being is that I'd done some um, what do you call it um, fates opening fates and things yeah. with the singers and Jeffrey and people like that yeah. and um, and they found it difficult I mean Roy coming along as a voice, art, a voice artist trying to sort of hide him out the way, get him mic'd up, <laughs> sure, to, you know, all those difficult. sort of things. It's difficult when yeah. it's a lot of public sort of thing. Yeah. So they said, look, Ron, you do Zippy's voice ah. and work Zippy, and that will be much easier. Yeah. So I, I did my, my Zippy voice. <laughs> so, and that's how, that's how I started doing it. And then, and Roy was quite happy with me doing those because, sure. in fact, he had a young family at the time. He was living in Brighton. Right. And, you know, travelling over to wherever it this fate might be. Yeah, something of an inconvenience. A bit of a, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> he eventually, um, what sadly when he passed, they asked me to take over and I've been doing it. Do you uh, do you mind? You've had such a long and varied career. I mean, tens of credits on, on IMDb, yeah. uh, the Muppets uh, yeah. and Labyrinth, yeah. and, uh, just all sorts of things. Do you mind that you always end up talking about Zippy? No, not really. <laughs> I mean, it's the longest, I suppose, character that I've, been associated with so therefore yeah. you know he's going to be asked about really yeah, yeah. and you know he's a naughty character he's a know-all yeah he's um i think a character a lot of people wish they could have done or been <laughs> sure. like yes. when they were kids Absolutely. and he gets away with murder apart from when he gets <laughs> that's out. right that's right uh, so over the next couple of weeks we'll be talking to you about your long and illustrious career thank you and also about your sort of skirting around the worlds of jerry anderson yeah now we know well i know that you've uh, you've 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 been hands on with quite a few jerry anderson characters that our viewers and listeners may not even know about ah so. right well i can tell you one a quickly a little bit a story we did a children in need two years ago yeah and I was asked to operate, because I'm sort of well-known for doing string puppets, marionettes, uh-huh. um, to operate, I think it was Virgil. I hope I'm right. I've yes. to, I haven't looked at it for ages. Right. Uh, and I did him doing a little bit. And I, this was a, I don't know who constructed him, but obviously it was lovely, yeah. gorgeous. And yeah. it was fun to do that. Um, f- I also did Zelda, not the voice, but yeah. um, did the puppet. Yeah. And that was quite fun. Yes. 
Um, and also, I think I'm trying to remember on that one programme, I did so many different puppets on that programme, but, oh, I think I did a Captain Scarlet or a Captain Blue, I think. Right, OK. Which was quite, and they were quite different yes. characters to How to interesting. So yes, well, that was all fun. We'll talk about those much much later. Oh, now, lovely. So, Good. as we're straying into the worlds of Jerry mm. Anderson, Ronnie, yeah. I'm afraid we're going to test you on your Jerry Anderson oh, knowledge. Right, now, OK. Don't worry, it's just a bit of fun. Thank you. Thank but you. we're <laughs> going to show you some very, very quick clips from the opening titles of every one of Jerry series. Right. And let's see how many of these you recognise. Okay. So shout them out when you see one that you know. Right. Ready? Yep. Off we go. Oh, this is, I know, this is Twizzle, of yes. course. Well yes. done. Oh, I think this is Torchy, You're doing isn't well. It? Yes, oh. great. I didn't think... Oh, I loved it. Five, uh, no, um, Four Feather Falls. That's the one. Oh, and Supercar. Well Wonderful. done, Ronnie. Yes. yes. Oh, and Fireball XL5, Beautiful. loved it. Yeah. Oh, yes, indeed. Stingray. Yeah. Oh, well, who would not know <laughs> Thunderbirds? Yeah, yeah, that's a pass, I think, isn't <laughs> it? We'll give you that one. Oh, lovely, Captain Scarlet. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh, now that, I did know that. Joe 90. Well done. <gasps> oh. oh, yes. Now, I did know this one, but it's gone. It's gone. Next. Oh, yeah, these are the ones that have passed my childhood. Oh, sorry, um, I right. didn't know that one as well. <laughs> Remember that dog? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, no, they're all going fun. Oh, we're Terror Hawks. Well I did done, know. yes, good. Oh, yes, I love that. Oh. It was a stop frame show. It was. And it was fabulous. Cat, uh, oh. It's gone. Oh, but I do know yeah, it. Yeah, OK. Oh, and I love this as well. Lovely animated yes, series. Yes, beautifully done. Saw that years ago, loved it. There we go. And that's your lot. Oh, well, well, well done. Phew. Very well done. <laughs> yes, I mean, you were groping for quite a few there. Yes. Dick Spanner. Dick Spanner you is the one. Dick, I Dick loved Spanner. it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And the one at the, almost at the end there, Lavender Castle. You Lavender Castle, as well, which you I did see and loved. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. You didn't do too badly at all. You got 10 there. Ooh. 10 out of, I think they're 18. Oh, so is that's there? over it's, halfway. So look. Thank you very much indeed. Does that? Where does that go? Well, now, uh, <laughs> as we're starting our first block of the new year, you will get the honour of being the first uh, little Thunderbird to go on the edge of our table here. Oh, so I see. Over the last few months, we've been building up quite a few of our previous guests, <laughs> and we thought we'd start again for the new year. Right. So, in due okay. course, you will be blue tacked stuck to on the, the table. Lovely. So, well done. So, uh, interesting there. So, you knew a lot of the earlier stuff, which yeah. we might uh, yeah. expect. So, is that uh, your earliest memories of Jerry Anderson or it, watching TV? What it you... is, really. I mean, I think, I mean, I literally started with Twizzle, and I always remember because I don't know what age I was, but quite young. Yes. And um, I watched this series, and I was always fascinated how the legs grew. Yes. And I was desperate to meet the puppeteer who did it because I would have thought, you know, I'm, I'm probably it was just, you know, a simple thing of fixing the legs to the ground and then oh. pulling up and the legs oh. grew and then the arms grew I thought well That's they right. just let a string go and mm. it just flopped through. they probably mm. did that for the legs I have no mm. idea yeah but that started me thinking you know um puppets yeah there's a quite a lot involved in puppets even though I know that was one well it was the first wasn't it it was indeed sort of series and yes you know, that's right um I've read quite a lot of history about all that and, yes you know it I'm was sure. quite difficult to do because you know, being the first, you've got the dip puppeteers who are doing their thing, and then it was very simple backgrounds, and yeah. there was shadows and all sorts of stuff, you know, that yeah. sort of got in the way. Well, we've got a little that. scene for you to watch here oh, from right. Twizzle, so oh, uh, take a look at this, and maybe okay. we'll have a chat about it afterwards. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Help. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. That was obviously a meant shadow there. Yes, the that's back. right. Yeah. This scene takes place in the, in, in the nighttime. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Look at that. Leave us as tall as an anchor. <laughs> Goodbye, Twizzle. We won't forget you. Slight dolly waggling there, but anyway, there yeah. you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whee! Down he goes. Goodbye. Goodbye. 
sweet. There. Oh my goodness, I haven't seen a clip of there you Twizzle are. for yes. I don't know how many years. The so. only surviving episode, I think. Twizzle is and, and Footso there, yes. Oh, the, right, the, yes, the, the, the cat, cat, wasn't it? That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. So uh, you mentioned a, a slight, what are the puppets? Oh, it was it, it's a Jack in a Box one. Yes. He was, you know, and I, I mean, it's just a puppeteer's. Um, yes saying that, you know, if they wobble around a bit, it looks like Dolly waggling. It's a terrible expression, isn't <laughs> it? It's really good. I like it. That's <laughs> nice. Uh, but also that, that gives us a sense there, that, and I think we can all sense it as we watch it, that that's quite primitive work there. Yes, indeed it is. But the lady who um, did the puppetry there, Joy Laurie, she was famous for doing Mr. Trim... No, Mr. Trimble, was it, or something? Oh, right. gosh, I hope I've got the right character. Mm. It was on BBC Whirly Gig, mm. and it was this amazing little character and funny enough Peter Hawkins voiced it this uh -huh. was way back in the 50s yeah. and this is fairly sort of very yes. early 60s uh, isn't uh, it? 50s in fact 50s yes, in right, fact yes. right yeah. okay Indeed. so um, anyway no I, it was yeah they they were um, it was it was interesting um, I, I, I'm going to do something in April this year which is sort of linked to what we're talking ah. about is that um, she, Joy Laurie was born in Essex and in Colchester um, there's going to be a, a, a sort of, I don't know what it will be, I think a sort of Gerry Anderson themed mm -hmm. um, event mm -hmm. in Colchester Castle. Um, there's a, a guy called Graham Farley who is putting it all together mm -hmm. and he's asked me to come along and talk about some of the stuff I've done yeah. with the Thunderbirds oh, characters yeah. actually, Brains, and I did other, well, I've told you about Virgil. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um, they're also sort of trying to give, a, um, I suppose, uh, the life of Joy Laurie because she lived in Tiptree, which is not, you know, in, in Essex. Yeah. And they want to sort of show a bit of her life. So I'm quite interested to see <laughs> what goes on there. But that's yes. the link with, I see. with that too. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so let's go back, if we may, to the beginning. Ooh. Oh, wow. Little okay. Ronnie LaDrew. Little Ronnie LaDrew. <laughs> Born right. in uh, Toronto, Canada, is that right? Yes. Oh, you've done your homework. That's <laughs> marvellous. Yes, so, indeed. And then what brought you to the UK and at what well, age? Well, my parents... Well, I was three on the boat. Uh -huh. It was the boat so oh, yeah. across from, you know... Uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. And I was brought over be with my sister I mean mum and dad well my dad decided he would like to have an English degree he uh -huh. was a teacher he'd, he'd got a uh, Canadian degree we're all born in Canada uh -huh. so that yeah. was the thing I see. anyway so um, um, he well we just left all the stuff in um, yeah. <laughs> in Toronto and came over and landed in Southampton yeah I think my mother had an aunt who lived in Poole in Dorset we stayed there for a bit yeah and then we moved on to London Primrose Hill or quite right huge. but it was just a room I think in a yeah, yeah. in a huge house yeah um, um so it was pretty you know uh, well, not we weren't very rich. I think we spent all the money, or my parents had, getting over to England. Yes, and quite so, right. And he was still studying. He managed to get um, an English um, ah. degree eventually. Uh -huh. But anyway, we moved from there, and we went to a flat in Clapham South. This is all very interesting, I'm sure. I don't know. <laughs> but then we... <laughs> you're very kind, Richard. <laughs> then we went to... Um, uh, where did we go? Stockwell, South London. Yeah. And we had a, uh, lived in a council flat for there. And that was the beginnings of my puppetry career. Uh -huh. It's a long way round to doing yeah. it. But um, what happened was we used to have long school holidays in the summer, yeah. six weeks. And what do I do? Well, I've been watching lots of Jerry Anderson uh -huh. and other puppet stuff, Sooty and Sweep and uh -huh. various things that were on at the time. And I thought, you know, I could do a bit of puppetry. So did, were you even then, as you were watching, You, uh, what age were you then? I'm trying to think. I was probably, when I was watching, um, if it was the late, it, I would be about eight or nine so watching. So certainly old school. enough to realise that these were puppets. And, oh, definitely. And, yes. Oh, yes. And I was really keen to have a go. Yeah. Because I, I just thought it was quite fun to yeah. do something, put your hand into something and yeah. work something. I didn't think I was attractive enough to be a major actor you see ah. so I thought even at that age I never stopped me no <laughs> no yeah. it hasn't no anyway but what what it was was that I think I could do stuff and I could entertain the kids around the flats because there were loads of kids around oh, yeah. who were you know waiting to go on holiday if they were going yeah. or not and we rather than playing on the bomb sites because it was bomb sites around in yes, the time when yes. I was there. anyway um, we, we did uh, we put on shows so I had a few Pelham puppets 
puppets. Do you remember the Pella I puppets? I do remember Pella puppets. Right. Quite uh, uh, synonymous with a lot of Jerry Anderson uh, Absolutely. Uh, puppets, There's loads actually. of characters that he, right. um, he got made from that. Yeah. Anyway, so... Um, I, I had about three of those. I had an upturned table mm -hmm. um, from, oh my goodness, this is so so terrible when I think back. <laughs> and, and I had a wind up gramophone that somebody gave me with yeah. 78 yeah. speed records. I think Gracie Fields and I had Victor <laughs> Sylvester. I mean, I wanted proper, wonderful music, but there you are, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. I played those and I danced the puppets around. Yeah. The, and the kids sat, I was on the first floor, the kids sat on the stairs going up to the second floor, raked auditorium. I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> oh, perfect. And, <laughs> and so right. I'm doing this show. And they seem to like it. Yeah. And I seem to get a bit of a buzz from doing these sort of shows. I mean, I really, they, I, I sort of cringe at the thought of how terrible they probably were. Oh. But anyway, there you go. Yeah. And then um, from from there, I discovered Pollock's Toy Theatres, the Victorian oh, yes. uh, cut-out figures. Right. And they're wonderful. And I love that because it was a sense of theatre uh, in a way that you could have the scenes and you could have lighting if you, you know, could get it, get it going. Yeah. I, mean, I did manage to get... I mean, nowadays you can get these lovely tiny little bulbs and things mm. and everything is a bit... But in my day, it was um, battery-operated, great big old sort of torch bulbs with um, sweet paper wrappers over to oh, give the yes. colours okay. for the lights and all lovely. that. Lovely, yeah. Um, but by this time, I would be 10, 11, 12, 13, that sort of age. So I was getting a bit older and a bit more wiser about how to do but all these But obviously things. there's something of a, a, a performance gene in you. Does that come from yeah. anyone else in the family? Well, you know not of? really, not yeah. that I know of. Um, no, I think it was just me. I just decided I wanted to do it. I wasn't sporty. You can yeah. tell I'm not a sporty sort yeah. of chap. And, uh, and I just loved anything. I used to, well, I used to watch, as I say, the wonderful shows on the telly, but yeah. I used to like Sunday matinees with my mother. I think she was probably a bit of an influence because she loved all the, the Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire movies, all yeah. those sort of musical numbers. Right. And so I'd sit and watch those and think, oh, this is show bears. Yeah. Oh, I love all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'd watch those and get, so I think they influenced me a lot, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, while I was at school, I did do some puppet, sort of puppet bits at school, but it, I wasn't very happy at school. I, I wasn't academic at all. Uh -huh. And um, I wanted to get out there as quick as possible. But um, after doing the Pollocks theatre shows, and bits in the school, I then discovered there was a puppet guild, and it's called the British Puppet and Model Theatre Guild. I'm now president. I mean, <laughs> isn't it extraordinary? <laughs> right. But anyway, are, yes. a little 14-year-old went <laughs> yes. along there, uh -huh. and um, I met all these amazing puppeteers who were iconic in a sense that puppeteers or the puppetry community would think, oh, my goodness, these are amazing people. So there was people like Wanslaw, one, who wrote a lot of puppetry books in the sort of, I mean, way back in the... In fact, he founded the Puppet Guild in 1925. So, wow. I mean, he was getting yes. old. He was yes. quite an old chap. And he was yes. doing his marionettes. Yes. There was Wardo Lanchester, who did amazing puppets and had a shop at the time that I sort of knew him in Stratford, um, Stratford-upon-Avon. And yeah. it was that was great and wonderful figures, beautiful yeah. car figures, trying to think of other people. Um, oh, in fact, that's when I met John Blundell, uh -huh. who was this wonderful sculptor and puppeteer. And um, basically, he said to me, he said, well, you know, it's great being here at the Guild, but come to another organisation called the Educational Puppetry Association. Well, I was so excited to meet this guy, John Blundell, who I'd, by that time, I knew that he'd been you know, made some stuff for Fireball XL5. He'd yes, also been, right. you know, and then Sting Ren Thunderbirds yeah. later. But anyway, all that stuff. And I thought, oh, this is, t and of course, Jerry Anderson, who, as a kid, you're yes. going, oh, wow, yes. I've met somebody who's involved in it. And he said, yes, let's go to EPA. And he said it rather quickly. I thought, I'm going to AP Films. How marvellous. <laughs> and, you know, I'd read the credits enough times. I knew it was in style. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, um, he said, oh, I'll meet you at Hoban Station. I thought, that's he odd. Comes, that's a, exactly. <laughs> anyway, we went along, and it was this basement down um, just off um, Bloomsbury, um, which was a wonderful, creative little environment, but full of glove puppets and a wonderful couple who um, educated teachers for sort of using puppets for education and all that sort of yeah. stuff. But it, it, well, it sounds rather sort of, you know, stuffy, but it wasn't all. It's great fun, and yeah. the teachers were wonderful. And um, so that was that. But anyway, John did, it was a huge influence because eventually I went, you know, I sort of 
well, he told me all about, well, he gave me my first card. Now, I've got, still got it somewhere. <laughs> Black and white picture of the, the um, Fireball XL5 character. Uh, so Steve yes. Zodiac yes. and Zuni and all those. Because right. he designed Zuni yes. and everything. Anyway, so I was sort <laughs> of uh, thinking, oh, so I took that to school and said, look, <laughs> I know that man who made those pubs. So, you know, I was... I was uh, yeah, quite happy about I mean, that. This is uh, not a familiar <laughs> story, but many of our guests often pinpoint a person or, oh, right. or, or a couple of people who have been sort of champions for them in their, usually oh, right. in their young life, and yeah. set them on a particular path. Yeah, and I think that's important, is it, as a youngster, to see uh, older people actually making their way in that industry gives you uh, a, a sense of hope that you could do it too, perhaps. Absolutely, and John was that person, yeah. I think, at that time. I'm then did meet other, obviously other puppeteers, but John was the one who thought, and he took me to theatre. I mean, bless him, he was terribly kind. Yeah. I mean, I visited, um, saw lots of dance. I yeah. saw, you know, all sorts of variety stuff, even musical stuff, yeah. which was still sort of happening around the sort of late 60s and all that. Yeah. And and there were influences that really helped me develop my feeling for puppets and what sort of characters they could be and now, all that sort of stuff. OK, so that's interesting. So you say develop your, your feeling towards mm. puppets because mm. it is a very special relationship and a mysterious relationship, I think, yeah. to many of us between the puppeteer and their puppet. Absolutely. How would you explain that then? Can oh, you explain it? Well, I suppose I can. Um, it's something that you, I, I know for me, when I first started, I was I hated what I looked like. I didn't think I was, you know, any good. Mm. But I could be any character. I could be a tiny character like a mouse mm. if I put it on, if it was a glove puppet or right. something. I could be a giant in the same show. Right. And nobody would see me because I'd be behind a booth yes. or whatever. And that was the sort of the thing that I quite liked. Nowadays, of course, things have changed. A lot of puppeteers are visible yeah. doing their puppets. I do quite a lot of stuff like that now. Yeah. I had a booth show initially, all started at the EPA there with John and, and Violet and Panto, these lovely people that were around at the Educational Puppetry Association. Yeah. And I, I sort of, div I, I thought, lovely, I can be. Any characters that say, but I'm behind the booth, nobody sees me. Oh. And I could pretend, I could develop voices and right. character stuff. And so that's what I did. And then, then after a while, I gave up log lugging this stage around. Yeah. Because I didn't, I mean, I, the puppeteers don't, by their very nature, don't make millions and yeah. millions of pounds. Yeah. It's, it's, a it's a bit like a nurse. You're dedicated to the art. Uh -huh. And you just get your wage and occasionally yes. you get a film job. You think, oh, thank you. That's I handy. may be going on holiday next <laughs> year. But, <laughs> you right. know, that sort of thing. Yeah. But um, so I um, gave, as I say, gave up the stage, but I had a, what I call my bag show. And so I just had a bag of puppets. And I sat down, a bit like I'm doing now, yeah. and I'd produce a puppet on my hand yeah. and we'd chat and I chat to the audience. I loved the communication with the audience, well, always have done. And um, and they don't seem to look at me, they look at the puppet because I'm and that's focusing like, that's on right. that. That's right, and that is, I suppose, your ideal then, that we're not looking at you, we're looking at the puppet. And Absolutely. That's, it's a deflection Absolutely. almost, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. I mean, I suppose that... And yet we admire your skill, so you can have it both ways in a way. That's right, <laughs> that's right. I, I think um, the very first sort of puppetry... Um, a professional puppetry I did was at the Little Angel Theatre in Islington, North yeah. London. And I was John Wright, who was the founder director's second apprentice. Yeah. And um, that was way back in 1963, 64, that sort of time. Yeah. And that gave me a tremendous feeling about theatre and how things are put together. Yes. Sound, lighting, right. you know, the whole thing. And his marionettes were absolutely beautiful, yeah. wonderfully carved figures. Yeah. And um, I don't know, I think that gave me, you know, a feeling of drama and mm. all the rest of it. I've not already been doing little bits, as I've said before, but this was in a professional way. Yeah. And he never wanted to play down to children. It's yeah. very similar to Jerry in a way. I don't yeah. think any of his stuff, he wanted to do stuff that Absolutely. was... Absolutely. Anyway, That's right. so um, it was... It was a great, great experience, and I'm still involved in the Little Angel Theatre now. Yeah. I mean, this is 60 years yeah. later. Right. So. Uh, now, you also mentioned that you would, you would travel with a bag of... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, as you did today, and you brought I some uh, characters along for us to would enjoy today, Would you like today, to Ronnie? see? Of yes, course on my would. lap, I have Who'd we have here? here? Well, I also, I mean, I'm jumping ahead now, yeah. but I worked on a film, Labyrinth, which was Jim Henson's, and I had to audition for that. Yeah. So I hope you can all see. I'll play yeah. to my own camera. Here we go. <laughs> Hi there, and I did this as my audition piece. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was, wasn't it? So what what did you do? Well, I did this. I went. <laughs> 
you, you clean. Yeah, I've got to do my back. Oh, right. <laughs> Oh, right, fine, lovely. I wish I could is do that. that. Yeah, I wish I could do <laughs> yes, that too. Exactly. <laughs> and so he was, this one is a copy of the one that I had made. I'm not a puppet maker, believe it or not. A lot oh. of puppeteers make their own figures. Yes. I don't. I love performing and doing all the sort of production side music yes. and, and now, uh, occasional writing. So uh, looking from the outside at this very real living creature who's joined us in the room... <laughs> What are you doing technically then? Uh, well, I can take the puppet off and I'll show you. It's yeah. basically, it's all about your wrist and your fingers. Yeah. And so when I, you know, oh, hi there. Yeah. You know, and oh my God, this is me in the nude. <laughs> you know, so that's, <laughs> that's sort of, and it's just that really. And it's about wrist and finger movement. Yeah. Really. And as you say, you're giving that your full attention, which means we give it our full attention. Absolutely. That's mm. exactly the thing. Uh, I would never sort of say, oh, hello, I'm doing a puppet show. That, where yeah. do we look? Where yeah. do the audience look? So it's all about focusing on that. Yeah. And then, and, and if it focuses on me, <laughs> I re obviously react and yes. stuff like that. So yeah. it's, that's the And in a sense, the that ju just your hand there became a puppet. Yeah. For, so in yeah. a sense, anything can be a puppet. Is absolutely, that true Absolutely, Richard. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> right. Yes, you know. My nose. No, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. interesting. And uh, and who else have you brought? Some very familiar well, faces. I, I brought. Can see. Some, I'll, I'll start off there with this one. I don't, can you see him? I, I'll do him down here so you can see him in front of me. Ah, uh, uh, hello. I uh, am little Zippy. I was in Rumpelstiltskin. Yes, I was Richard. And that very was good. an episode. But I was also in. Uh, let me think. Oh, I know. Uh, Zip Man, which was basically <laughs> Gingerbread Man story, <laughs> and I was running out of the oven. Yeah, I know. Thank you very much. And you can probably hear he squeaks a bit now. He does because he's yes. getting a bit old. Oh well, you know. But this was made by the same person who made the Zippies and Georges mm. on the th and and I asked actually. I feel quite honoured that I've still got him because yeah. basically. Um, I suggested in the read through, you know, that when we did these programs, we, you know, we read through on a Friday and yeah. recorded on a Wednesday and yeah. Thursday. Anyway, um, at the read through, I said, look, you know, it'd be lovely to have a little zippy if he's rumple stiltskin running through. And I know that Jane, the musician who was on the program, yeah. she was going to find him in his little, in the woods or something. Oh, yes. And it would be lovely to see a little one. And he was, and <laughs> Roy did the voice for him at that time. Yeah. And he did a little squeaky sort of zippy <laughs> voice, you know, which was quite sweet for him so he, he had a little costume on at that uh, stage and, but, a, and uh, a rare example of seeing the puppet's legs indeed yes. and people sometimes and that's a great question because some people say um, why don't we see Zippy's legs and I always do a Zippy I always say I choose not to show them and that's my <laughs> regular answer which is great. quite funny uh, but uh, yeah isn't it lovely and also he's quite podgy isn't he really yes he is which rather. is quite yes, sweet so he used sweet. to sort of yeah. run around you know, and do his, Lovely. Do his thing. Uh, which brings me, actually, onto a picture that I posted on uh, Twitter many weeks ago. Oh, yes. Uh, where I first came across it, Ronnie, because ah. uh, uh, every year I go on holiday with a lot of friends and we, on a Saturday night we have a bit of a fancy dress theme. And right. uh, this year it was uh, children's television. Oh. So we had to, a chance to, to make our own <laughs> costumes, so I apologise for ah. this. But uh, let's see... Well, that's not bad at all. You don't think it's... I think no, it's quite frightening, it is, isn't it? It's frightening. But I tell but... you, what, what I was very keen to get was the whole... The, the one arm thing. Brilliant. Which, which, you, which you've me... definitely got there, haven't you? <laughs> now, so tell me, how did you make him? Well, it's, it's a papier-mâché uh, oh, right. head made, uh, I think, uh, two plastic bowls, which I covered in ah, papier-mâché. Ah, yeah, got gotcha. And uh, yeah. printed out some eyes and stuck a zip on it. So and you couldn't see it very much. I if, couldn't see very much no, at all. No. I mean, literally through that, That's maybe right, through the yeah. gap in the yeah, mouth. Yeah. Yes. But you've got the zip on and well, all that, the lovely blue eyes and everything. And the rubber glove for the And you've got the the sort of three fingers. <laughs> yeah, I was which trying for I, that. You That's did right. very well. No, that <laughs> yes. I'll give you definitely... Um, Nine out of ten. Well, I'm very happy Is that with that. Right? It's amazing. <laughs> that's literally made my day. Yeah. No, that's so lovely. that was when I sort of first came across you. Well, yeah. of course, I say first came across you. I've been watching you my whole life. <laughs> but that was when I was able really to put a name and then eventually a face right. Right. To, to, the, to the character. Right. Um, and lots of other people have very similar feelings. Now, we do have ah. some questions from Ooh. our wonderful viewers and listeners okay. uh, about you and your career and your various characters. Would you mind uh, diving in? Oh, right. And uh, let's take three or four out of there. Uh, I think, uh, have I taken three There's or a four? couple there, I think. Uh, one, two. Oh, yes, two. And right, and I'll do another one. Oops. That's it. Yep. There we Perfect. go. Perfect. Let's see what they have to say. Right. Well, Kenneth, um, is it Wick, Wick Kendon? Oh, yes. And he has said, 
What one thing can you say has changed the most from early in your career to now? Oh. Wow, one thing. Well, I suppose I'd have to say sort of Zippy changed my whole career in a sense that once I worked him for all those years, I mean, it became I became sort of well, resident puppeteer at Thames Television, you know, oh. which, which made me get... I mean, I was able to do other stuff. So I worked with Tommy Cooper oh, yeah. on a funny skit that he did, which was wonderful, this yeah. magic ball. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know how I kept myself a straight face doing that. Yeah. He was just a wonderful guy. Did a tiny bit on Morecambe and Wise as well. Because yeah. all these programmes, at the time I was there, were the big entertainment programmes that were going millions on. Millions upon millions of people watching Absol- every week. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that was... That, very exciting. And then, of course, from then on, you know, I mean, the Jim Henson came into mm-hmm. my life, which mm-hmm. was basically um, auditioning for Labyrinth because they wanted extra puppeteers, mm. additional puppeteers, I think they say. Mm. And so I did that and got on to that. And then from there, I went on to Muppet Christmas Carol, Muppet Treasure Island, mm. Little Shop of Horrors. Um, and so it goes on. The so one I was very lucky. You must have noticed over all that time is the change from sort of practical puppetry to, you know, computer effects and so on. And, and even the two of them then working together. Yeah. Have you had much experience with that? Yes. Um, I mean, I, I did I started off fun enough in, I think it was, um, I'm trying to think the first time I used radio controlled stuff because that oh, yeah. was like the beginnings of um, puppetry being controlled by, you know, um, um, I don't yeah. know what you call Almost it. Almost animatronics, you know, right? I Yeah, exactly, yeah. sort of animatronic stuff. Mm. And that was quite interesting. Um, but then um, I, I did work on stuff which had a mixture of, you know, computer-generated stuff and live action. What I find, which is quite interesting, um, in fact, one of the programmes I did do, or wasn't a programme, it's commercial, and it was with Brains from Which Thunderbirds. we'll see next week, yes, that's oh, right. Will you? Oh, yeah, lovely. Yes, well, indeed. that was, a lot of that was computer-generated. Yes, right. And, and then we had the real... Puppet. Yes. We had a version of brains. And, and do you mind that? Do you feel it's treading on your toes a bit? Or, Not really. or can it complement? Well, you think? I thought it wasn't... It, that particular commercial was, went, was quite good. Mm. It worked quite well. Mm. I mean, I can tell you, if we we'll see it next week, yeah. um, I can tell you when the real puppet went yes. and the, the, the computer-generated one came yeah. in. The only thing I remember from that um, was that the puppet brains... He was doing a dance with a broom and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And... Um, he fell on the ground, which is fine. That bit was fine. But getting up, there wasn't that uh, effort to get oh, up. And he's yes. went... Ugh. Yes, I see. And I thought, oh, that's a shame. Uh-huh. And they, there's something, obviously, they couldn't at the time. They may be able to do it nowadays. Yes. But didn't have that effort. Yes. And with a puppet, I always like to... When I'm teaching, I would say, show the effort as well. That's interesting. Because that's the sort of thing that people are fascinated yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. So, but right. yes, that was... I, I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, 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 Keith. sure. Shall I do another one? Yes, go on, let's Okay, see we've got perfect. Jonathan Bell. Mm-hmm. What was it like working with Michael Caine on Muppet Christmas Carol? <laughs> How nice. Fabulous is the word. Yeah. Um, I was an additional puppeteer. I did lots of puppets going, looking out of the windows when they had the street things with Michael and yeah. Kermit and were walking down the sort of snowy yes. streets. Yes. And I did the one night scene I do remember, the time that we did have a bit more connection with Michael as puppeteers, was the final scene or one of the final scenes when he visited the Cratchit family yeah. and, and he turned over a new leaf and he brought them a turkey ah, yes. for their Christmas yes. dinner. And he had placed, it was placed on this tape and the camera pulled out and revealed a lot of sort of, there was a Cratchit family but also friends that were all invited. And I was two puppets at the sort of table there uh-huh. just looking and reacting. Yeah. And um, obviously there was lots of takes and different you know angles and stuff taken just for that one little bit. And uh, Michael turned around and said, do you know, and we were in a pit underneath. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you'd never know that when you watch the film. Yeah. But And he was on a sort of rostrum, you know, with yeah. a table. And right. Everything. And he went sitting there at the head of the table and he looked down at us like this and said, hey, hey, you guys, it's amazing. I never look at you when you're doing the puppets. It's always about the puppets. You're fab. And we kept saying, well, you're not bad yourself, Mr. K. You know, and all this. I mean, he was so nice, down to earth. And um, that was the only time that I had a chance to sort of uh, yeah. you know, chat to him yeah. in a way. Yeah. Because, yeah. again, when you're an additional puppeteer, there's a load of us. I yeah. mean, there was probably 20 or something, maybe more. And we were sort of always asked to do, you know, the, those sort of scenes, the, yeah. the, the group scenes, sure. really. 
But um, what, what's so key about moments like that, and and, and the Muppets in general, actually, mm. is that the the, hub, the, uh, the actors are, are taking this world absolutely seriously. Yeah. That's what's so sweet about. I love those it, films. and there's some. I know there's some actors that perhaps are not very keen. Actually, it's interesting when you're talking of that. I mean, the Muppet Show was one of those yeah. shows where they had brilliant stars on yeah. every week at the ATV or whatever, and. Um, some, and I, this is me being in my critical eye, think that actor's not really terribly, mm. you know, mm-hmm. it's a little bit like I want to be, you know, yeah, this puppet is upstaging me, mm. you know, sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. and, oh, although they were, you know, within the script and everything. Yeah. But I always feel that, but there are some who completely, as you say, yes. just, oh, it's a puppet. Yeah, and it's not a puppet, it's a character. That's right. I mean, the famous Parkinson um, interview with Miss Piggy. Right. I mean, I adored that when that yes, came out. Yes, absolutely. And because yeah. he was totally... Yeah. There was no question that that... that That's right. Miss Piggy was a real, a real person. And in a sense, a it's Piggy. their reaction that gives the, yeah. the puppets life. Isn't absolutely. It? It's, it's, we, it go, we go back. through them. Yeah, it's yeah, really interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And one, one more, I oh, think. Oh, yes, there, right? one more. Sorry, we've done, Jonathan. That's all right. Let's see who this is. Matthew Mayhew. More recent shows that use puppetry tend to use more rod-controlled puppets rather than string-controlled that we were used to in super marionation yeah. shows. Yeah. Um, are there any reasons for this, and which do you prefer? Well, actually, I love working both because I was brought up working marionettes, so I loved... Now, t- the, I'm going to stop uh, you there. So tell us the difference. Once and for all, what's the difference between a marionette and a puppet? Right, OK, a marionette is the posh word for a string puppet, a okay. puppet worked with strings, right. usually from above, okay. and um, it has a controller and all the rest of it. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Um, and I love the... When I'm doing a marionette, and sadly I didn't bring one here today, yeah. but um, to work one, people are, even to this day, even if they've seen loads of you know, computer-generated stuff and yeah. all, all clever you know, technicalities and stuff, yeah. um, they are engrossed because there's a distance between me and the puppet. And I'm doing very little, really. I'm there, they know I'm there, mm-hmm. and I'm working the legs and I'm mm-hmm. doing the arm, and the puppet's just moving, you know, very, mm-hmm. usually quite, um, uh, not big, sort of wobbly mu- movements, yes. but, you know, quite sophisticated movement. And they just, oh... What that thing is like, and and I just see it all the time. Yes. people just get drawn into this thing. So marionettes are very special. Yeah. I think it's quite as Jerry and everybody uh, here would know. That filming marionettes isn't the easiest thing in yeah. the world. Yeah. they can look absolutely dead, or they can be yeah. wonderfully alive. Yeah, and that is there is an art to that. Uh-huh. Uh, but. Um, I think people also, it takes ages to learn how to work a string I'm puppet. Sure. The most technical of all yeah. the puppets. But a bit of a showstopper, I know, but Christine Glanville, one oh, of uh, Jerry's wonderful. operators, yes. would Which often arrive met? at conventions uh, with yeah. brains or a, a yeah. Tracy brother. And as you say, everyone's attention would drop to, to the absolutely. marionette and not to Christine. You know? Oh, uh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the same thing, I mean, I'd seen Mary, Mary Turner is another yes. friend, you know, and she, right. she's worked all these amazing things. Yeah. You think, you know, you. I mean, she's actually quite a quiet, reserved sort of person anyway, yeah. and it's all sort of there. And you, d- you wouldn't immediately want to look at her, but yeah. it's the power of that puppet, as I call it, yeah. you know, taking your total attention, yeah. which is really exciting. And rod puppets then? Well, What's rod the puppets, and- I think because I've said that string puppets take a while to learn, yeah. and I think it all comes down to finance as well mm. nowadays. The fact is that a rod puppet perhaps is slightly easier to learn right. and quicker to learn if you want to use it for a show or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And um, so people, you know, and it's also, it's fixed your hand. It's part yeah. of your hand. I mean, I just demonstrate, this is what I would call a glove rod puppet, the beaver, which I've shown you. Yeah. But, you know, he's got his rods down yes, here. I see. And it's all about sort of working, working <laughs> those <laughs> you know, sort of thing, and they you can you know you do sort of wide yeah movements uh-huh. and you close your hands and you do yeah you know, like, sweet you know, it's oh. it's all um <laughs> it's so all funny. there I mean I it's funny doing it like this and, oh stop doing it. oh I don't like your glasses <laughs> stop it I'm going to put him off because it's very yeah, rude yeah, yeah exactly but uh, anyway stealing. yeah no Rod but I love them both um it's not really which one I prefer I I if it's if I'm asked to use a rod puppet I'll use a rod puppet yeah if I'm asked to do a marionette you know in a sequence yeah I will I mean the 
classic example just recently was um, Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, mm -hmm. which I had some you know time on that, mm -hmm. and that I had a lovely time because they wanted a, a marionette sequence in it in the Podlings, if those people who know about that uh -huh. show. And um, so I had a podling reconstructed as a marionette and I did a piece and I remember the director who was wonderful Louis, a French guy, and he was actually did um, um, Steadicam, I'm as well as oh, directing. Yeah. Oh my Amazing. goodness, I'm, it was. And he filmed my sequence, you know, doing, yeah. and I was just working this puppet <laughs> up on this rather <laughs> rickety, um, um, sort of, well, it wasn't boxes. It was a little bit more safer than that. But I was <laughs> yeah. up quite high doing yeah. this. And they, but they, they, some people, the production said, "Look, we do that with CGI. Right, and it's not a problem." Mm. And he went, "No, yeah, we do this. Everything we do in this show is going to be puppetry." And <sighs> Wonderful, which was really lovely. Yeah. And they loved it. I mean, he loved it. And yeah. lots of people, you know, after it was commented on. And it's only a few seconds sequence, yeah, yeah. but it's, sure. it lovely. was there. And Jim used it, too, in his original Dark Crystal film. He had a sequence, which I think he was sort of replicating a little bit uh -huh. from the original film, where a podling marionette did oh, a little bit. So, sweet. No, yeah. it's good. Lovely, it's lovely. Good. Uh, now, just before we play our final game, then. Right. Uh, just a quick clip that you've alluded to already, the Children in Need uh, oh, right. special 2022, I think, so a couple That's of years right. ago. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and now I've slowed down the footage. We'll hear some music, but I've slowed down the footage for a couple of Anderson references. Okay, so, uh, lovely. We should be able to see that Oh, here. great. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Zippy. There's Zippy. There he is. Oh, lovely Zelda. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yes, I think That's I was it. Captain Blue. I really can't. Oh, oh, yes, and I was definitely. Oh, here we go. Look at that. Just the poor acting. <laughs> That's right. There we go. What I think is so sweet is that you have one poor from each of the characters yes, as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So yeah, so a nice thing to have done. A very, quite a busy day by the looks of it then for you. Oh, it was amazing. Or two or three. Yeah, I, I can't remember. I think we. I think it was just a day. Right. Yeah. You know. I mean, yeah. got there early, of yeah, course. Yeah. And we were. And I was, in fact, on that. Um, um, Children in Need um, bit, I did, what did I do? Also did Muff in the Mule a bit oh, as yes, well, which is okay. like the original. Yes, string amazing. Uh, that caused much excitement on our uh, podcast listeners' Facebook group uh, when that was first shown. People say, did you see Zelda on guitar? Oh, and did you see lovely. the Tracy boys at the piano? So, oh, uh, nice. It did not go unnoticed, as Thank you might imagine. Oh, well, that's good. Thank right. you, fans. Now, <laughs> just before we say goodbye, yeah. time for a very quick game, which we call Quick Fire Five. Right. I'm going to give you five either or questions. Right. Okay, and it's up to you to pick your answer. Are you ready for these? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, Glove Puppet Zelda or String Puppet Captain Scarlet? I think Glove Puppet Zelda, believe oh, it or not. Oh, okay. Yes, I know. Interesting. You're right. Isn't it? Uh, you need a pet, but do you choose Rainbow Zippy or Stingray's Oink the Seal? Oh, difficult one, but I'd have to choose Zippy, wouldn't <laughs> Would you? I? Yeah. I mean, it would kill me if uh, okay. I didn't choose Zippy. Would you rather have Bungle singing the theme to Thunderbirds or Sooty singing anything at all? I'd rather have Sooty. <laughs> oh, oh, sweet. Sing. He doesn't speak, but no. he'll whisper it oh, very quietly oh. in somebody's ear. Uh, Christmas on Tracy Island or in the Victorian London from the Muppets Christmas Carol? Oh, that is a really difficult I'd yeah. like to do both, but oh, yes. I'm going to go for, I think I will go for Muppet Christmas Carol. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, no, I love Tracy Island. And finally, the Spectrum agents for Captain Scarlet are all named after colours. So mm. choose your colour from the Dulux colour range. Are you Captain Autumn Mist or Lieutenant Cherry Blush? Ah, I think I'm Captain. It would be Captain Blush. <laughs> you know, yeah. Very good. That's your quick five five. Uh, we'll see you again next week for more. But in the meantime, Ronnie, where can people get in touch with you if they well, want to find you? Well, I on? have a Facebook site. Yeah. You can find me, Ronnie LeDrew. Yeah. I'm also on Twitter or X, yeah. or what do they call it now? Instagram. Ah. I think I'm on a fi on Instagram. I'm something like um, Snitch and Dodo or some some silly name. But I think <laughs> you can probably the best way to do it is to Google Ronnie Ledrew. Yeah. And honestly, oh, I know stuff comes up there yes. that I haven't seen. You know, <laughs> I think I know. did I do that? It's you know, amazing. But yeah. that you'll find various things Great. there. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us. We'll see you again next week for part two of our interview. More viewers and listeners' questions. Excellent. And another look at your career. Thank you very much. Thank Richard. you so much, Ronnie LeDrew. Thank you. Lovely Ronnie LeDrew with a wealth of stories yes. about being a puppeteer. And lovely Richard LeJames yes, as well. Yes, yes. Yes, but this is all about Ronnie. And his brushes of the Anderson universe. It's funny that, that he never really quite no. got in there. It's funny how the things work out, isn't it? You'd think he would have worked on something at some point. Yeah, but it's, you know, it, not every puppeteer in the world has to have worked on an no. Anderson show. There are no. plenty of other things, as yes. Ronnie has 
alliterative. Exactly. Uh, yeah, well, more from Ronnie next week. We'll be hearing more about his career and his other Anderson connections uh, in part two of his interview in pod 293. Well remembered. Thanks. I had to yeah. look down. Plus one. Uh, but in the meantime, before we head on over to the randomizer, shall we head on over to our YouTube channel? Oh, yes, please. Uh, because apparently some Stingray limited edition collectible figures have been available recently. Oh, I forgot about those in the News Digest. <laughs> well, Whoopsie. we'll mention them now. Uh, Ian Dealey says, those figures look great. Uh, Liz Sunny Bunny says, wow, those figures are amazing. Peppermint oil capsule <laughs> says, amazing. I love Stingray. Rude. Uh, now, I know XL5 is more niche than Stingray, but any chance of some XL5 merch? If I had a pound for every time somebody looked at a bit of merch and said, yeah, but what about the other thing? Ah. Uh, then we'd probably be able to afford to make those bits of merch. I see, fair but enough. Sadly, uh, that exchange doesn't happen. Yeah, that's uh, right. XL5 is more niche. It's, it's tougher, but we, we're, we're doing some XL5 stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are so you- I... Couldn't, yeah, because yeah. by the time this has come out, we've had a live stream talking about it, which oh, is the yes. XL5 technical manual. There's another thing I forgot in the news digest. Right, God, I'm so rubbish, aren't I? I know, I know. Dear, uh, dear. Even just doing it once a month, you're still rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, uh, Disney Daniel says Stingray turned 60 years old this year, to which Alan Crisp mentioned, uh, well, so too did most of the original viewers who first watched the show or older. That's true. It's nice aging with a TV show, though, isn't it? Is it? I think it is. Yeah. I don't know where I'm going with that. Probably cut that out. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, yes, I wonder who the oldest Stingray fan is. Or the youngest. Right. Maybe they're in the same family. Who knows? Anyway, should we move on? Yes, let's move on to uh, some comments beneath uh, pod 290 from a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Uh, Les Paul Davis, although I like to think he's French and it's Les. Yes, Les Paul we've had Davis. this conversation before. Have we? Yes. Really? You're so predictable. I don't recall it. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, Les yeah. said... Been waiting for Thunderbirds to make a randomizer appearance on the podcast since it became visual. Yeah. Uh, and been waiting for the episode Path of Destruction to appear since I discovered the randomizer a few years ago. Uh-huh. Then both come along at once. What are the chances? What a great start of 2024. Yeah, lovely. Uh, <clears throat> the Curtis Randall. Oh, yes. Not a Curtis Randall. No. Oh, see, I was going to make that joke, mm. but I thought you'd just take the mickey out of me. Uh, says, great content. Thanks. I miss my tea with your father at Pinewood. He was super wonderful to sit and chat with. Right. Well, Curtis well, Randall. We need to know more. Yeah, pr- please provide further information yes. about this tea. Yeah. I mean, you know, P- PG, Yorkshire, <laughs> no, 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 not so much the tea, Jamie. Oh, the, the chats. The chats. That's what we Sorry. Yes. yes. Interesting. Uh, Mr. Slip Skirts. Is that rude? I don't know. I've said it now. Yeah, say it anyway. Great interview with Prentice Hancock and great clips from his previous appearances. Can't wait for part two, uh, which is out last week. Yes, a shame how he was treated uh, re year two. He looks great and kind of like the first clip still. Yeah. I mean, he's aged very quite recognizable. Well. Absolutely right. Yeah. Prentice, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, I've got one here. The last yes. one from YouTube. This is from Dave. Oh, yeah. Dave says, Well, Jamie, thanks for reminding me I'm approaching my 70s. Ah. Sorry, That's Dave. That's a problem. It wasn't yeah. just for you. But. Yeah. Um, he says, I've watched from XL5 straight through. Right. I loved Shane Rimmer. Uh, God rest him. I spoke to him many times at cons. Uh-huh. Sheila used to say it was like a family reunion. Oh. Uh, we got on that well. It was lovely, isn't it? Yeah. I've just spent New Year's Eve binging on UFO again. Or 1999, the prequel, as he's calling it here. Uh-huh. However, and there is always a however. Yes. Does there have to be? I want the UFO manual... Uh, and YouTube, YouTube keep me, directed me to buy it, but it's out of stock. Right. Can you please get this one back in the store? Uh, yes, it's on the way. Is it? Yes. I think More it's news. back in, in March. Wow. I, I see. I, I yeah. Oh, we mm. did, can you edit this all together? Into, no. No. Okay. I just thought, I want commission here. Why not create hoodies from the different uh, series? They said hoodies. It does. I think hoodies might be a thing. Hoodies. Yeah. You think? I think they're kind of a scarf hat thing. Oh, hence Udi's TM. Ah, right. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, mm. I don't even know what they are. No, really. we'll have so, to look uh, that up, uh, Thanks, we? Dave. Mm. Uh, we'll do some research. Yeah, great. Uh, yes, uh, all for now, but there is a, a, a plethora of, uh, of, of nostalgia and interest and enjoyment to be had on our official Jerry Anderson YouTube channel. We can guarantee all of those things. Yeah. Uh, so do leave your comments and we'll read them out next time. But, I mean, it's the moment we've all been waiting for. The end. No, not quite. The randomizer. Yes. Yeah. Over to no, you. That's great. Chris and Ronnie. Oh. Ronnie, thank you ever so much for coming <laughs> along to see us today. And you've brought some friends along. Who's this? This is Beaver. Hi there, I'm Beaver. Hello, Hello. Beaver. And can I, I press the knob thing? Is that we... why you've come here today? Yeah, you want to I press like the button doing on the randomizer. You need to do it. 
You are more than welcome, my friend. Yes. Whenever you are ready, oh. you may press the button on the randomizer. Right, here we go. Oh, he's good at this. Oh, I like doing it. Oh, you I... only get one go. Oh. Get one go. Well, it's something's it's happening. Yeah, something is happening. Yeah. Ah. Well, we have an episode of Fireball XL5. Fantastic. Yay! Yay! It's one of your favourites, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I like it. And it, I believe it's one of the, the final episodes ever made, if not shown. It's the Firefighters. Oh. So thank you very much. Thank you, Beaver and Ronnie. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> So, we welcome back to the randomizer, Fireball XL5, with uh, one of the final episodes to be produced, I believe, uh, for reasons that we'll come to shortly. And there's a familiar sound effect. Uh, not only did... I love the reveal of that title. Uh, not only was it used in uh, Captain Scarlet several years later for the sound of the Mistrong sources, it was also used in the Avengers in, uh, from Venus with Love. But I love the way this one just throws us straight into not only action, but quite intense and quite destructive action. Places all over the world are being hit by these uh, fireballs, appropriately enough. Uh, a lot of stuff going up in flames all over the world. We even have stock footage of forests and such. Are they going to play that stock footage of... Um, th there's a legendary story of... Uh, uh, a, a warehouse going up in flames near, oh, I want to say Elstree Studios, where they were filming one of the ITC shows. And one of the directors went tearing off down there with a camera uh, to film it so that they could uh, use it in shows. And then it started turning up in things like The Saint and such. See, that cloud we located in space just beyond Earth's atmosphere. Do you think that's got something to do with it, Commander? I don't know, Lieutenant. Scientists throughout the world are checking now. Yes, this is not the uh, first time we've had a suspicious cloud from space. They were oh, little traffic, uh, little vehicles going through the fire there. There's definitely probably some people died there. Okay, continue to stand. Uh, yeah, clouds from space were a problem in this show. Brazil has been hit. <gasps> not the Hall of Justice. This is getting serious. Where, where will the super friends go? Oh, where are we going to hit now? <gasps> not the house. Oh no! Ah, yes, that, that house doesn't appear to have a... There we go! There's the ITC um, fire that appeared in multiple episodes of multiple shows. Uh, almost as famous as the infamous White Jag. Uh, oh no, who's this? <laughs> I love that the, the beginning of this episode is just so blatant. Here's a place. That is gone! Here's a vehicle. That is gone! Uh, this is uh, a lot of death and destruction um, for the beginnings of a Fireball XL5 episode. Okay, uh, got the position. Right. Luckily, you don't see anybody. Crashed hit by ball of fire. Steve Ooh. Zodiac is on his way back from Space Patrol, Commander. Oh. He's nearest to the space cloud. I know that, Lieutenant. He always is. I also like the I'm fact that, uh, if I'm right in saying yes. that this is the final episode produced, that the, uh, the enemy in this episode is literal fireballs. That's a lovely touch. XL5 to Space City. What can I do for you, Commander Zero? There's a cloud drifting from space into Earth's atmosphere, Steve. Oh dear, not again. Yes, sir. Uh, this is... Uh, I've also recently started re-watching XL5. I realised I hadn't actually watched the Blu-rays. Uh, so I'm now watching one episode uh, a week on Sunday nights. Uh, I'm only five episodes in, so it's quite... It's quite something to suddenly go from there to the very end of the series. If he wasn't the best space pilot we've got, I'd fire him. What do you make of this? Mysterious? He's the only pilot we've got, Commander. Everyone else is so incompetent that they've crashed their ships. Uh, yeah, it, there's not a whole lot changed from, from where I am, Episode 5, to this. But uh, I think Commander Zero's characterization is is probably the most drastic difference. As yes, I thought. The, the cloud is a collection of gas, Steve. I'll ah. get closer and you can collect some oh. samples. We've solved it. The cloud is made up of gas. We're going to have this settled in no time. Uh, I suspect that's probably cigarette smoke as well. Fire. Tail section. Oh, no. Matt. Well, there's always some oxygen trapped in the rocket exhaust, Steve. I guess the gas found it and Bingo! It's ignited! That's surprisingly credible science for this show. Well, take over, Robert. Keep on free float. Keep 
born a brave load. Well, does this mean we have to break out the fire extinguishers? Get right, Steve. It, whatever happens, the fire mustn't reach our fuel tanks, or we'll mm. blow up. Look, That's why I'm casually sauntering in that direction, Steve. I don't think we need to rush into fighting this fire. Oh no, we do have a fire on board. <laughs> oh, Steve's abandoning ship. No, no, no. Uh, he's probably going to check it from outside, leave fighting the fire to Matt. Yeah, I suppose technically the, the safest thing would be to shut yourselves off in, in Fireball Jr. and just open the open the uh, the doors to space to a certain extent, but this is good stuff as well, and I always find it quite um, not upsetting, but it's like it, it hits slightly closer to home than normal when you see XL5 damaged like this. Uh, I think that's why another episode uh, sabotage is quite effective because it's like you know this to a certain extent is is home almost uh, it's part of the family and to see it distressed like this is uh, it is a bit surprising uh, we've got the fire under control I believe luckily that naughty old space cloud is uh, it was a close one folks not going to interfere with us having a drink. Did too much damage. Well, it, uh, it's proved our theory, Steve. Oxygen. Fire damages stuff. Will we make it back to Earth okay? Providing we avoid that cloud, yes. But XL5 will have to undergo a thorough check at Space City. Oh, no. Well, thank goodness there's an entire fleet of other XL ships and equally competent crews to investigate the cloud. Oh, no, wait. Half of those were killed off by the last space cloud, weren't they? Yes. Uh, is this a job for XL1? Well, you've had experience of this fireball firsthand. Now, mm. what's the answer? Uh, it's a tough one, Commander. <laughs> if only we could find some way to enclose the main cloud before it reaches Earth's atmosphere. Yes, yeah, that's a plan. Steve, uh, we could then inject the oxygen into it. Oh, there's the emergency <laughs> bell that they introduced in uh, Robot Freighter Mystery and, and gave me a giggling fit that time. I, I'd never noticed that that was in later episodes. Particles. What's going to happen if the whole cloud decides to drift in? Oh, no. Earth will be one mass of flame. I've got it. We'll move to the moon. Our white elephant. You remember, Matt, that giant satellite that was built here. Uh, you mean uh, uh, Skyball 1? Ah, yes, this is where they bring in... Whoa. It was intended An old, abandoned space station. It was obsolete before it was completed. Don't tell me it's still in existence, Steve. That was built years ago. It was one well, of So were you, Venus, but you're still here. Well, how about it, Commander? Is it still around? You know full well it is, Zodiac. <laughs> Even though we've never mentioned it on the show before. I don't mind. That's fine. Because this... I, I really respect this show, the way they make it seem like the World Space Patrol it is a big place uh, and also that there are civilian uh, ships out there and, and quite a few other organizations too so we've got skyball one uh, that we're banking on saving us from the fireball cloud in space i hope so venus he hasn't got much time no. but you know matt he always works best under pressure and we don't have to help at all we'll be assembled in space yep with the suction pumps and the oxygen tanks in the control compartment, I should be able to fix that cloud for good. Oh, that sounded and almost personal. To report on that gas so basically, we're going to retrofit the space station and turn it into a vacuum cleaner. What's wrong with these aerials? That's fine. Uh, I slightly, it's a slightly silly idea, but I can go with it. I guess it's time I had a new Neutroni receiver. Within the logic of this show, it, it works the fine. The latest model, the D400 Mark 10, is a dilly. I don't a know how I dilly? expected to control all our spaceships. I thought he was going to say that it's real boss, but a dilly. Okay. Well, Commander Zero's radio is on the blink. That is going to come into play later on in the story. Meanwhile, here we are at Venus's beach house. See you in the morning. I love that Zuni sleeps in a little basket. Uh, it's very sweet. Welcome. I wouldn't want to trust him alone at home with so many valuable um, bits of china and ceramic all over the place. Good, you can help me tidy up. This place is a mess. Ah, back to sleep. 
Oh, he's doing it. Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm on the same wavelength as Zuni. I'm not sure what that says about me. Probably nothing good. Anywho. Station nine to Space City. Cloud direction Earth. Drip. Lieutenant Liney, what are you doing up there? Message, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. I I'm the one who sent it, sir. That's my voice. We have an emergency red alert on our hands, and my receiver has to act up. Maybe you should turn it off. It looks quite dangerous. Spaceships. Oh, the console's on fire. That's uh, almost a line from uh, the old oh, console goes up. A TV Twenty One Star Trek comic. Uh, I don't know if it was suffering spaceships. It might have been suffering starships. But yes, shows you the kind of uh, thinking that went into the Star Trek TV Twenty One strip or Joe Ninety strip. I should say that the Star Trek strip that was featured in Joe 90. Here comes another fireball. Where's that going to land? Well... From Station 9, a fireball is heading straight for you. Somewhere near here. Alert Space City, Lieutenant. This is quite serious. Because again, as I said, you know, it feels a bit more dramatic when it hits something personal. All the fire heading towards... Uh, we don't want to see Space City in flames. We don't want to see XL5 in flames. So this is... This is quite tense, because this isn't some random installation in the middle of nowhere. Where is this fireball going to hit? Venus's beach house. We spent a lot of time here over the course of the series. That's an interesting piece of jazzy music that I don't recall hearing in other episodes. Oh, it's no good, Zuni. I can't just sit here. I'm going to ring Steve and get him to take me back to Space City. <laughs> I'm sure he'll appreciate me wasting his petrol. Oh. I'm sorry, Zuni. But I am a member of the World Space Patrol, and duty comes first. Oh, oh, here it comes. Venus, get out of there! Oh, no! The ball of fire is heading straight for Venus's beach house! And she's throwing a party tomorrow night! What about the party? Oh, no. There it is. Gone up in flames. This is... This is quite intense for this show. Um, this is now a hit very close to home. This is literally someone's home. Let's get out of here. And it's not even a place that they've set up for this one episode. We've spent a lot of time uh, over the course of the series here. We trap Zuni. This is one of our main characters' home. The fire's all around us. And it's, yeah, quite sad to see it go up in flames. This is how we know this is one of the last episodes to be produced. In that, much like in Day of the Light, a day in the life of a space general, when they destroy the Space City Tower model and probably one of the XL5 models. This is all being set on fire for real. They save filming this scene, this episode, until the very end of the series where they're reasonably sure that they're not going to need to come back to this set. Oh, Zuni! Which is why the puppets are very close to the fire because if anything happens, well, Oh, that was an impressive bit of puppetry. Uh, oh, that was even better. Come on, Steve, get them out of there. Uh, yeah, if anything goes wrong, Venus. as I Venus. believe went wrong with Venus at some point during uh, the filming of XL5, uh, one of these last episodes, Venus got a bit too close to some fire or explosions, and uh, the late, great David Elliott said, oh, leave it to burn. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that would have been the case, considering, you know, we, we see her just fine here. But that's still a quite an intense scene. Uh, and again, this is someone's home, one of our regular characters' homes. It's quite, quite poignant in a way. Oh dear. Yeah. This is all very effective. And then we get this rather sad bit. I feel genuinely sorry for Venus. Oh, Steve. Steve, what happened? Once she works out where she is and what happened. She's overcome by the smoke. My house. Oh. My house, is it? I'm afraid it couldn't be saved, Venus. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Oh, Steve. Oh, even Zuni's Steve, crying. My beautiful house. This is... Yeah, there, Venus. Don't worry. We'll build you a new house. Exactly the same in every way. One with an untwistable stomach. 
It's the second Simpsons reference I've made in, in one episode. Uh, yes, I suppose that's one of the strengths of knowing that you've got the end of the series coming up. You can destroy recurring elements for real, and it doesn't really matter, and it adds a bit more drama. I checked on Fireball XL5. The night crew will have her ready for liftoff in the morning. Yeah. Tomorrow is going to be a big day for me, too. I've been promised a new D-400 Mark 10 Neutroni receiver. Uh, Commander, a little thing about the end of the world, Commander, potentially is tomorrow. Uh, but sure, your new radio, that's the, uh, that's the highlight of tomorrow. Have you checked on the three rockets? Yes, sir. They're ready on the launch pads. The prefabricated gas tank for the cloud is being loaded now. Uh, liftoff is at 09. I guess all the other uh, other XL ships were either away from Earth or just broken. Uh, if XL5 needed to be rush repaired. That was a nasty shock you had. I'm all right now, thank you, Professor. You know I'd rather be with you and Steve when we're on a mission. Oh, what about Zuni? Who's going to counsel Zuni? He, he lost his basket. Rockets up there. Poor guy. Reports that the cloud is moving in a mass towards our atmosphere. Roger, Commander. Starting 10 second countdown. Warrior oh. 7. Oh, yes. 10. 9. Ship. 8. I like as well the, the, uh, the sense that there is more going on around the Space City than just XL5. That you have these warrior rockets, that you have this Skyball 1 space station. Uh, that, you know, this is Space City and space stuff is going on here all the time. We're set up for multiple launches of multiple vehicles, even ones with strings on. Stand by, Trooper 2. A warrior? A trooper? I wonder, though, if, if any of this is stock footage from previous episodes. Again, you know, if you've got it, why not? One. I suspect zero, some of this might be. There are rocket launches elsewhere in the series, in like the Sun Temple and Flight to Danger. And it's only you know, later generations that have got DVDs and Blu-rays where you can watch this stuff over and over again and, and notice that it's cropping up again and again. Uh, viewers at the time wouldn't have noticed, if that is a reused shot, viewers at the time wouldn't have noticed that that's appeared multiple times. Roger, Lieutenant. They should be in orbit ready for us by the time we get up there. It's all go this week. You've got to say there's rarely a moment as this episode pause for breath. It's great fun. That's something else as well. The, the ability to destroy your existing sets, it, can, it, it injects a sense of drama and a sense of urgency, which really helps the pacing. Get ready. We've got a lot of work to do, and fast. Yeah. That gas cloud hasn't got far to go. It rushes you. The two rockets are in orbit. Keep XL5 in a free float. Is it Warrior 7? I sure wouldn't like to lift that down on Earth. Oh well, to work. Ah. So Steve can work. Ah, this is clever. In the vacuum we can move around a lot of heavy equipment to uh, prepare Skyball Station. <laughs> oh, poor Venus. She's push pushing a, a piece of equipment that looks like a, a large beach ball. Uh, again, no one else is helping with this except for our three heroes. Uh, They're all done after a brief montage of preparing Skyball for, for service. We're just going to leave it there. I'm not sure what plan B is if this doesn't work. Uh... Prepare to operate remote suction pumps, Matt. The cloud is approaching the sphere. Hmm. Yeah, what would they have done if the, if the, the cloud had gone to Earth from, a, from the opposite direction? Eve? We shall never know, for the suction pumps are now on. They're sucking up that naughty cloud. 
Ah. Oh. I, I do love the logic behind this idea. It's working okay. It's some nice, well, nice stops. atmospheric music. Uh, even if reversed footage of, of clouds never looks authentic, but you can't really help that. So we've captured the cloud. Hooray for us. The gas cloud is secure in the container, Professor. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Steve. We can detonate it now. Okay. Release oxygen valves. We're well out of the blast area. Releasing valves now. Wait for the big bang. You could tow it away from Earth, just in case exploding the, uh, the station with the explosive gas inside doesn't work, uh, or at least creates uh, an even larger explosion with potentially devastating consequences to the Earth. Your lever has been operated. Oh. It's not working. One of the valves. Well, that means the oxygen can't get through to the gas. Oh, no. It's broken. Steve, the container is being pulled back towards Earth by gravity. If it enters the atmosphere, gravity. it will explode. Then the entire Earth will become a giant fireball. whoops a daisy it's Valves. We didn't think this through. Steve, Steve, that'll be suicide. Y you can't do it, Steve. You'd never get clear before the gas exploded. No, Steve. Oh, no, but it's one Please, life no. against everybody. Or Earth will be a raging inferno. Oh. Take over, Robert, and return to Sphere. Again, it's very suitable uh, dramatic stakes for the final episode. I also think this is... We're getting a mix of model footage and what looks like a painting of, of Skyball. Oh. Of course, Steve's going alone to fix it. Because of course he is. He's there, Venus. He's the only one who can solve it. Oh, he's so brave. Matt was right. A fuse has blown. I'll have to release the valves and try and get clear before she goes up. Take care, oh, Steve. What's Steve doing, Matt? Uh, probably risking his full neck. As usual. <laughs> I'm so over that guy now, Venus. I read an acts of heroism and saving the whole world. Uh, it's very it's last week, Venus. Whoa! Okay, so he's done something. He's flicked the right switch, and now he's booking it out of there. Fast as he can. Come on, Steve! Whoa, there it goes. Um blowing him out of Range. Man, Steve has been caught by the blast. Oh no. Oh, he's all right. Sorry about that, folks. I lost control for a minute, but I. <laughs> I almost wasn't smooth there for a moment. Oh, this is a nice way to end the series, though. La la la. XL5 to Space City. Come in, Control. Guess who saved all your butts again? Doubly clear, I might say. Ah. Here's the payoff for Commander Zero. Neutroni receiver cut. <laughs> getting his new radio. But since you went up to get rid of that cloud, I've had a brand new D400 Mark 10 receiver fitted. Yay! Ah, oh, Commander Zero has got a nice present. Commander making small talk across space. Yes, <laughs> Steve. He's just like a kid with a new toy. Listen, he started already. Space City calling. This is an odd way to end the series. I, I, I assume this is the final episode produced. Space City Special feels more like the series finale, where they do a big musical number and everything. But this is funny. XL30, have you anything to report? Well, someone please say <laughs> something! Oh, what do you know about that? Now that I can hear them, no one's got anything to say! Oh dear. Or it could be that these are all destroyed ships, and you didn't think to replace any of them. Could be. Uh, anywho, that was Fireball XL5, The Firefighters. Oh, that one starts off strong and just keeps keeps going. Uh, incredible, incredible pacing there. Some really great drama, which is not something you can always say for this show. Uh, this at times felt more like an episode of Thunderbirds, you know, where the, the stakes just keep going. And uh, yeah, for once, the threat becomes very close to home. It's not just our heroes are thrown into a pit by some naughty man going, ma ha ha, I'm going to destroy you. It's like something is, is coming to us and setting our home on fire. How horrible. 
Uh, I also like that it's a threat that doesn't have a villain behind it. This just seems to be some kind of natural force. Uh, very rare for this show to to, to present uh, an adversary like that, an, an adversary with no face almost. So yeah, all the way along, The Firefighters is a fantastic episode of uh, Fireball XL5. I'd say that's uh, probably one of the all-time greats. Good stuff. Well, Fireball XL5, I mean, literally mentioned it a few minutes ago. And here it is, up it conjured crops. up. Pardon? Conjured up. Oh, right, yes. yes. That's right, by the randomizer. Yeah, by Chris the randomizer. Well, by the randomizer, not by Chris. I suppose he does do the conjuring, doesn't he? Sort of. Well, Ronnie did. Well, Ronnie did. It's yeah. getting very confusing now. Yeah. I just like it in the old days when Chris used to have a special guest on audio yes. from one of the series yeah. and have a nice little comedy sketch and then they press the button. Yeah. Those are the days I miss. Right. And I know Chris does too. Does he? Okay, Chris, well, we'll see if we can bring it back for you like that. Okay. Uh, no, that was lovely. Who loves? Who doesn't love a bit of XL5 yeah. nostalgic, yeah. sweet, yeah. tweeness? That's right, exactly. Uh, more from the randomizer next week. More from all of us next week. Mm. More fab facts. Yeah. Uh, more from Ronnie LeDrew. Oh. More from our wonderful Podstroms. Ah, but no more News Digest. Not for a few weeks, no. no. I'll but, try and do better next time. You know, time. if something happens, we'll mention it. Yeah, why not? How's that? Okay. All right, see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. How can I uh, hmm. do better for the what, News generally? Digest? Well, oh, no, not better. Oh, no, 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 no. We haven't got time for that. No, full, we really full don't. List. Mm. So we should probably prepare. I, I should probably prepare, shouldn't I? Why? Are you a bit worried that it's not looking as well, slick felt, or professional it, as you'd yeah, like? I think it. I think it felt a bit flimsy. And then, and then <laughs> the fact that I went, yeah, that's all for the news. And then we kept going. Oh, and then there's that. And, and also this. Oh, I forgot to say oh, that. No, I think that's fine. I think it's part of our informal style. Our, our charm. Our charm, indeed. Really? And we have buckets of it. I keep them under the table. Yes, mine's got a leak, sadly. Yeah, I keep putting my foot in mine. Yeah. <laughs> nice. No. I better go and empty it. Okay. Oof. Bye. I wonder what the smell was. That was an Anderson Entertainment production. <laughs>